Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and today I'm going to cover over a bunch of news that I've found interesting this week. There is so much to keep up with right now in the industry, and it is ramping up so quickly. Firstly, we are talking about SpaceX's Starship on Mars and what plans are coming together to create the first mission. There was a fantastic talk by Paul Wooster at the 2019 International Mars Society convention in Los Angeles last weekend. Paul is the principal Mars development engineer at SpaceX, so we'll cover over some interesting information shared there. The convention itself was streamed live from Facebook, I believe, so I've got that linked in the description so you can watch the entire thing. Then along with this, we're going to cover some exciting new updates on Starlink and Starship development, including some great information discussed by Gwen Shotwell at the International Astronautical Congress over the last week. There is loads to talk about, so let's get stuck into it. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Now, although this event was not publicized anywhere near to the extent that Elon Musk's presentation was back on the 28th of September, there was some interesting new information by Paul, who is one of the founding members of the Mars Society. He has added some new clarity to SpaceX's plans specifically for Mars with the new Starship design. He was welcomed up on the stage at the Mars Society event by Robert Zubrin, who I'm personally a big fan of. Robert is an aerospace engineer and author who has been a huge advocate in Mars exploration for many years. If you're looking for a new book to digest, I highly recommend The Case for Mars, written by Robert, which describes the importance of humans exploring and settling on Mars. Now, he's never really been in favor of plans to return to the moon or mine asteroids as a stepping stone prior to proceeding to Mars. He's generally always held the opinion that Mars Direct is a better choice immediately. The main arguments for this really boils down to the resources available on Mars that will allow us to create a more effective permanent settlement for humans. Mars has higher gravity, it has a thin atmosphere, which is still useful, and recent discoveries really appear to indicate that water, as far as we've been able to tell, appears to be reasonably abundant. This is wonderful as we need water to survive and grow food. It allows us to create oxygen, rocket fuel, and energy in a number of forms. Elon Musk and SpaceX have had the same goal ever since SpaceX was first founded. It's the entire reason behind the design of the Starship, and although we've recently heard a lot in the media about returning to the moon first, I suspect SpaceX's role in this will largely be motivated by funding opportunities. The primary focus will continue to be Mars. So Paul shared a few interesting things that were new to me. Firstly, this shot here. I wish I had a better copy of this for you, but this is just a snippet of the presentation, which sadly wasn't the best quality stream. Regardless, what we can see here is a shot of the Starship landed on the moon, and we can see what looks like a massive rover being lowered to the surface. Here, there are a number of floors inside the Starship, so we can assume that rovers and other huge cargo can be unloaded from the four floors floors and easily lowered to the ground. Although we can barely see it in this shot, we have a crane component which opens as the upper half of this massive door. There is a brace here to take the necessary load of the cargo and we can just see the cables running down to the bottom half floor component that will be the platform for the cargo as it is lowered down to the ground. This is an interesting concept as it is using this split door system that opens right up and because the doors themselves are also the walls of the ship, it should be simpler and involve less architecture when compared to a completely separate mechanism. Now previously we've seen other mock-ups of Starship which have since been named the Chomper Design, which essentially opens right up with a massive door. This never really made sense to me as a vehicle that would be unloading cargo on the surface of the moon or a planet. So if there does end up being a Chomper Design for delivering cargo to orbit, it does seem clear to me that we'll see several different Starship designs created for different purposes. Of course, this older shot may not make quite as much sense now that the header tanks and other components have been moved up into the nose of the ship. It'll be interesting to see some more official plans 
for different Starship configurations. I suspect we'd probably see several core configurations, one for humans with cargo and supplies, one similar for unmanned heavy cargo missions, and then one for large orbital deployments like the Chomper design. Just a thought here really, but what do you think? How many configurations do you think we'll see and what purposes would each cover? Let me know in the comments. So most of Paul's talk itself was largely information we already know about previous material and information, but the questions and answer segment was really for me the most interesting part of the talk. The core idea behind Starship is that it will be fully reusable. This means it needs to re-enter the atmosphere on Earth and also on Mars. Re-entry from low Earth orbit is going to mean the Starship enters the atmosphere at over 27,000 kilometers per hour, or just over 17,000 miles per hour. This is crazy fast, but it is actually the lowest re-entry speed we're likely to see. If returning from a moon mission or traveling to or from Mars, the velocities we are talking about here are much, much higher again. If you need to wipe off that amount of velocity in a short space of time, you're going to be decelerating very rapidly. A question was asked about the G-forces expected on re-entry at Earth and Mars, and Paul responded saying that they expect Earth orbit entry to sit around two to three G and will wipe off over 99.9% .9 the velocity aerodynamically. An interplanetary transfer to Mars is much, much faster, especially if they do travel faster than required to shorten the overall length of the Mars trip. Even though the atmosphere on Mars is very thin, they are still thinking that they would decelerate that fast without propulsion to wipe off 99% of the velocity, just needing that longer propulsive landing. Now, I must admit, whenever I've done simulations or seen Mars re-entry simulations, the atmosphere was never thick enough to decelerate that fast, not unless you were extremely close to the ground at least. I'd love to see some more detailed information uh, and simulation data on whether this amount of atmospheric drag is plausible on Mars or not. What do you think? If you've seen any interesting information on this, let me know in the comments because I'd love to see it. Now, the other week I published a video talking about starships staying on Mars, at least initially for many missions. If you want to watch that episode to see my arguments about why starships should stay, there is a tile popping up in the top right here now. And while you're here, please do consider subscribing because without you guys, I could not keep doing what I'm doing here. So. Yes, there was a lot of interesting debate in the comment thread. Many comments there loved the arguments, uh, but there was quite a lot of criticism about the idea as well. Now, in Paul's talk, he has kind of backed up the idea of leaving ships on Mars a little. He said that with the exception of a starship for people that need a return journey to Earth, most starships are indeed expected to stay on Mars. And as I argued, it is going to make much more sense to send loads and loads of cargo and only a handful of initial settlers that plan to stay indefinitely. As Paul said, a lot of mass early on cures a lot of sins. There can be many years of support supplies and equipment available so the return is not necessary. The ships themselves would form a key component to the initial settlement and the material for the Starship itself could even be repurposed if needed. A massive structure is much more valuable on the surface rather than being sent back to Earth as an obsolete vessel. Paul also believes that because there is plenty of deliverable mass, there is really no reason we can't use current generation environmental control and life support systems. Now, for a while I've been wondering how they would go about pressurizing the tanks with no helium on board. Helium is not really available on Mars, so an alternative is needed that will work in replacement. Not a huge surprise here, but the intention is to utilize gases piped from the turbo pumps when the engines are running, so this will allow the pressure tanks to refill from the main propellant in the Starship. When asked about re-entry heating, Paul did mention that they may still be looking at ablative heat shielding for Mars missions since the need for minimal refurbishment for these vehicles isn't really as critical. So just another little argument there that supports the early Starships to stay on Mars argument. Now onto Starlink. Early in the week we had this comical tweet from Elon Musk saying, sending this tweet through space via Starlink satellite, followed shortly after by, whoa, it worked. 
Now, even though this may not seem impressive, it is a nice demonstration to show that Starlink is working to some capacity with the initial launch of satellites sent back in May. At the 2019 International Astronautical Congress over the last week, Gwen Shotwell, who is SpaceX's president and chief operating officer, said that they would need to complete six to eight Starlink launches in total to provide constant coverage in upper and lower latitudes. This should be a great proof of concept within these areas, but she also said SpaceX will need 24 launches to have global coverage, and added that they are hoping for all of these launches to be done by the end of 2020. To do that, of course, we're going to need to see around two Starlink flights each month. The next flight has slipped into November already, so we're really wanting to see these launches taking flight very soon to meet this target. As soon as this phase of the network is complete, every launch will simply be adding extra capacity to the growing network. Now, last week I posted a video about the additional 30,000 Starlink satellites requested on top of the currently approved 12,000. Interestingly, Gwen said that it is not certain that they're going to need quite that many. Uh, for global coverage, only a small percentage of this is required, but SpaceX will grow the network to allow them to offer customers a range of service options. Consumers of the new broadband service would receive a box from SpaceX when they sign up with a user terminal included to connect to the network. There's still a lot of planning going on in this regard, but Gwen did specifically say that knowing Elon, he wants everything to be beautiful, so the user terminal itself will be beautiful. The price point hasn't been confirmed in any way yet, but Gwen did use the example of millions in the United States paying $80 a month to get crappy service, so this may May well give us a bit of a hint as to what the plans may cost. We'll soon find out more about that in the near future, I'm sure. Now, I'd love to hear from anyone that would be considering this service over their current offerings. What many people don't understand is just how widespread terrible broadband services are. This can quite literally be the cash cow that SpaceX needs to fund their way to a Mars settlement. Around all of this news, Starship development has been screaming forwards in Texas with some much more substantial structures coming into place. There has been a lot of work going on with new leg mounts as we can see here being installed. A lot of work also going on around the new fin mounts, both at the bottom of the vessel as well as up here near the nose. Of course, there is more work we can't see going on continuously inside the Starship, so even though it looks like progress may have slowed in the last few weeks, I'm sure that wouldn't be the case if we could see inside. Over at Florida, the Mark II ship is also steadily progressing. What I really wanted to show you here was this incredible drone footage. This is from October 20, so about a week old already, but it is an amazing aerial fly around of the construction site. What you're seeing here is a lower quality version as well, but up in the top right, I've got a link to the full video by Andy here, so go and support what he's doing by subscribing. It really is awesome footage. As we can see here, it seems like the workers are already putting in a reasonably large percentage of work with the Mark IV version with loads of these new ring segments being prepared to stack together. Work continues of course on the main Mark II body and the nose, much of which again is likely happening inside the structure. So loads and loads going on. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please do take a second and hit that like button. As always, a massive thank you to my quality control squad shown here. I simply cannot do what I'm doing here without everyone's support. And if you're interested in these topics and would like to be involved in the growing community, follow my Discord or Twitter link in the description. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my Starlink video from last week talking about SpaceX's proposed 42,000 satellites up from the 12,000. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.